Well, it's good to be in the house of God, amen? amen? It's good to be here. I'm glad to be in the house of God. I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here with you and with you. And about, I'm glad to be here with the body, and to function as the body, and to not forsake the assembling of ourselves, as we learned in our last chapter, Hebrews chapter 10. So... Uh, so I'm going to try and I'm going to try and make this a little bit quicker than normal. We're going to try and speed through this and, and uh, get to Brother Patterson's anointed message and get to the FLC and have some good fellowship. But real quick, give me uh, give me give me something you know about Hebrews. What's something about the book of Hebrews? Give me a theme. Let's try it again. Faith. Faith. Okay. Faith is in the book of Hebrews. What's the well? Give me a theme. Better. What is better? Better covenant. Okay. Better testament. Last time Brother Steve had that. Better new covenant. Right. What, is, what, about the, what about the covenant is better? Better sacrifice. better sacrifice. Who was the sacrifice? That's right. Jesus was the sacrifice. Why was Jesus the better sacrifice? Perfect. Once, perfect. Once, once and for all. Once and for all, right? He's perfect once and for all. We don't have to continue these uh, sacrifices every year like they did in the Old Testament. Jesus paid it all. Isn't that right? Isn't that good? Yeah, I love that. It's the book of Hebrews. The main theme, Jesus is better. That's the main theme of the book of Hebrews, and I love, I love uh, studying the Word. The Word always turns me into a student. And no one, no one knows the whole Bible. I don't care what you say. I've got a bunch of commentaries that I resort to, and sometimes they get it wrong, and sometimes I get it wrong. And, but nobody knows. You know, we're not. No one's at full knowledge. We've never come to and just waiting like Enoch to be resurrected. That's just not going to happen today. So, well, let's get into the Word. But I'm going to recap a little bit. We just got out of chapter 10, and we were talking about, or we're in the, we're in the end of chapter 10, and previously we're talking about the, uh, the covenant, obviously, Jesus is better, and the, white, the writer warns of uh, saints' rejection of Christ, and that there would be consequences that follow, and all that leads up to Every, every verse of scripture is, is compounded on one another. You can't read one verse and just take it how you want it. You need to read the context. And everybody knows I love, I love bringing out the context. But in verse 32, get a little ring in here. But in verse 32, it's, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, But call to remembrance the former days. I'm sorry, Sister Michelle. It's chapter 10, verse 32. I just, I done jumped ahead and scared her. I don't know. Even I don't even know where I am. There we go. Okay. Now you can read along with me, but I always love to hear those pages turning in the audience as well. Right. Uh, chapter 10, verses 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly while ye, while ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Let's pray really fast. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Your word is truth, O oh God. It is absolute truth. And it is the only book that we can still continue to pick up and say, I can read and believe all this. And I thank you for that truth. I thank you for your spirit that I bear here today. And I thank you for the wonderful life that you've given us in Jesus' name. So these, this first three scriptures, I'm going to try and do this as brief as I can. And to be honest, it's been a very rushed weekend. I woke up feeling rushed. I got on the platform feeling rushed. And I went to bed feeling rushed. Like, I need to hurry and sleep so I can hurry and get up. So that's just how I'm feeling right now. And I'm trying to slow myself down. And I'm like, I'm ready to eat. And I'm ready to listen to Brother Patterson because I love how he preaches. And I'm going to try and take my time here. And I can't. And I'm trying to look at that clock to make sure I, I go a little quick. But so if we go in in verse 32. He's asking the people, we can see, but call to remembrance the former days. So he's asking the people to look at some past afflictions. And he's not just, and when we talk about the body, it's not just me, it's you, and it's those before us. So he's asking the people to look at the afflictions that they may have personally suffered, and look at the afflictions that maybe some of the forefathers have suffered before them. 
So he's asking them, or not even the forefathers, if you, if you look into it, I just learned this, it's a really cool fact, but this book, if you really got look into it, it's really talking to not a first generation uh, Christian family. It's really reverting towards people that have been in the faith for a while. And we know this, we know that, this is like a message of encouragement, and it's like, hey, don't forget, but it's like, this is a second generation uh, letter, if you, if you will. And that's kind of a cool thought to think about it. And it really helps bring out the context. So he's saying, remember what you've been through. Remember the afflictions you've ever remember. remember the former days after which ye were illuminated. Which I'm in verse uh, 32 if you want to follow along. After which ye were illuminated, then we would just say after you were saved, after you came to see the things of God, after you came to see truth, ye endured a great fight of affliction. Once again, he's talking about the personal experience, but probably some, some grandmas and some grandpas that endured it before them. And we all know that uh, Christianity went through some great trials and some great persecution. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit, but not a whole lot because it, it is very, it's very heavy. Uh, verse, 33, uh, verse 33, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches, partly while you, while, while you were made a, a public spectacle. You were, you people were looking at you, and you were made a public spectacle, you were publicly made fun of, you were publicly persecuted. That's kind of what that's referring to. By both reproaches and affliction, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. So, guilty by association is what that's saying. Like I, I, you know, Peter denied Christ three times. He was nervous about being guilty by association. And so he's just, that's all he's referring to there is, you know, sometimes you did, you, you, you suffered it because of who you were, and sometimes you suffered it because of who you were with. That's right. And that's how the body's supposed to function, folks. We don't, we don't leave islands out there alone. It's like, hey, brother, I'm going to take you by the arm, and we're going to go through this thing together. All right. And so that's, that's referring that to here. And he, he's not lecturing on that because this is, you know, second generation message. Or for, let's say, mature Christians, if you want to be a little more general. 34, for ye had compassion of me in my bonds. Now, we don't know who the writer of Hebrews is. We can speculate, but we know that the, the person that wrote Hebrews must have been in bonds at some point, right? So you had compassion on me while I was in bonds for Christ's sake. You had compassion on me, and you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. They took it joyfully when... You know, reproaches came, afflictions came, their, their things were stolen, the items in their household were stolen, maybe their food was stolen. And we know, and he's not even lecturing about what Jesus says, because this is obviously a mature audience and they know what Jesus said. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth, the corrupt, doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. Matthew 5, 11 through 12, blessed are ye, and this is Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, right? He's talking to his disciples here. Matthew 5, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and, say, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Right? We love that verse. We love that verse. And, and he's talking about the prophets before then, Jesus was. And, and now this mature audience that the Hebrew writer is writing to, they already know that. And he's saying, you did it well. You joyfully endured the afflictions of the persecution that was done unto you. You joyfully endured when your goods were stolen or taken or burned. Right? Now here's a little bit, a little bit off of the, not off the record, but into the historical books. Um, so we know that the book of Hebrews was written uh, somewhere in between 49 AD to like mid-60s AD. And most lean towards mid-60s. And after reading multiple uh, points of view, I'll say I lean towards the mid-60s. Okay? And I'm, you know, I might not be right. And that, that doesn't really matter. But what I want to share with you, and now this is heavy. And I don't want to share it with you lightly, but we've all suffered. And this is real something I'm real passionate about, so I'm going to try and get over it real fast. We've all suffered a little bit of persecution as a Christian. We all have. I was just 
talking about my talking to my sister about some of the persecution that I dealt with in, in high school, and probably she dealt with as well. And so we all have dealt with a little bit of persecution. But if you consider the ones that went before us, if you consider who was it, Peter, crucified upside down. If you consider James, who was pushed off the top of a, off the top of a wall of a, of a high building and then was stoned to death because he still didn't die. If you consider the people before us, we're kind of a moderate Christian. We're a little bit blessed here in this country. We're a little bit blessed for those that paved the way. And, and this is what was happening. I'm taking this out of Fox's Book of Martyrs. This was what was happening to the Christians that were in 50 A.D. to 65 A.D. to 70 A.D. This is what was happening under, the, under Emperor Nero of the Roman, of the Roman government, Emperor Nero. And I'm just going to read this. Nero was the sixth emperor, emperor of Rome and reigned for 15 years. He was a paradox, a man of great creativity combined with a vicious temper and extreme cruelty. It is said by many that it was Nero who ordered Rome to be burned and then blamed it on the Christians. If you study Roman history, Roman, Rome did burn for nine days, and he blamed it on the Christians to turn the wrath of Roman citizens away from his help. Others say he was not in Rome when it burned. Whichever way it was, Christians were blamed for the fire that lasted nine days and during which the hunt for Christians increased and became a dreadful persecution that lasted for the rest of Nero's reign. Take in mind, this is only one emperor. Many emperors did this afterwards. The barbarous acts against the Christian were worse than any had previously endured, especially those committed by Nero. Only a Satan-inspired imagination could have conceived them. <coughs> Some Christians were sewn inside skins of wild animals and torn by fierce dogs. Shirts stiff with wax were put on others, and then they were then tied to poles in Nero's garden and set on fire to provide light for his parties. This cruel persecution spread throughout the Roman Empire but it only succeeded in strengthening the spirit of Christianity rather than killing it. We've all suffered a little bit of persecution. We've all suffered just a little bit. But compared to the Christians who started it, compared to the apostles, we'd look at Paul if he came and walked down the streets of our, of our town today, we'd say, man, that's a radical. But we call ourselves apostolic because we believe and we sort of supposedly act like the apostles do. But when we read their stories, man, we seem a little bit moderate. Yeah. And if we began to act like Peter and Paul did when they marched the streets of Rome and Jerusalem, people would look at us and then, man, you're radical. But I see no other call in the Bible. I don't see a call for a moderate Christian. I see a call for a radical. And I was talking with my wife and my sister yesterday about Christians being hunted by the Chinese Communist Party today and that it still goes on but we sit here in blessing in America. That's right. We sit here blessed, so blessed. And I don't mean that to, to take a jab or take a stab at anybody but I mean that as a reminder that to thank God for the blessings That's and that right. the easy way that we are here has been yeah. paved for oh, us right. over and over and over again. That's the only reason I bring that up is because sometimes a little bit of clarity and a reality check will go a long way and get you on your knees and say, woe is me, Lord, I don't deserve the grace and the mercy that you bestowed upon me. Help me to be a radical. That's a strong, strong message, but it's something that weighs pretty heavy on me. And so we know that Governor Nero was in charge during the time of the writing of Hebrews, and we know that either these people or, or the people before them went through that kind of persecution. So when the writer of Hebrews says, call to remember the former days of the afflictions that you may have suffered, All right. that's a little bit of what he might have been talking that's about. Right. And that's, that's heavy, but I want to bring that to everyone's attention to get some context, get a little bit of clarity where we're at in the history books. He goes on to say, verse 35, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense 
of reward. We're at 1035. Don't lose confidence in the promises, he's saying. Somebody went before you and look what they suffered. Look what you're suffering. Don't lose your confidence. It's not all for nothing. All right. That's what he's getting at. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. It's not all for nothing. There is a reward. This life is but a vapor. Yes. Verse 36, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. I'm going to break this down a little bit. That ye have need of patience. In other words, for that could be endurance. Or you could say patient endurance. Because, and I don't want to go into this too deep because this is something else I'm really passionate about. I'm just kind of skipping over a couple things. But, ye have need of patience, comma, that, comma, after ye have done the will of God. So we could say, what is the will of God? Right? You need patience, you need endurance, that after you've done the will of God, the will of God is what? One or two deeds you did, you know, yesterday. Man, I help. Some grandma, she was... Some grandma, she tipped her shopping cart over at Walmart, and boy, the Lord just told me, I gotta help her pick up that frozen pizza before it thaws out on that hot cement. That was the will of the Lord. I was walking through the gas station, brother, man, he just gave me the grumpiest look, and the Lord said, open the door for him. That was the will of the Lord. No, it's a little more than just that. See, was Daniel who prayed three times a day, was he in the will of the Lord when he was in the lion's den? Yeah. Was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were in the fiery furnace, were they in the will of the Lord? Yeah. Was right. Paul not in the will of the Lord when he was murdered for Christ's sake? Was Peter not in the will of the Lord when he was murdered for Christ's sake? Sometimes we contort the will of the Lord with skippy, happy-go-lucky butterflies and puppy dogs, but sometimes it's not all about that, is it? Sometimes there's a little bit of persecution that goes with that because this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. This life is but a vapor, but if my life might shine like a bright light, then I might do the will of the Lord. What is the will of the Lord? This is something I'm so passionate about because so many people think when Christianity comes along your side and, oh, Jesus, rub my shoulder, make me feel good, Lord. You know what? Jesus is worried about one thing, and that's souls. And if you can make your life reflect a light that shines so bright that it attracts souls, no matter what the end of your life may be, you have done the will of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So that after ye have done the will of the Lord, ye might receive the promise. You're going to need a little bit of endurance for this race. You're going to need a little bit of a strength for this race. This isn't going to be easy all the time. All right. That's what he's saying. The will of the Lord. James got pushed off a wall and stoned. It was the will of God. Stephen was stoned publicly. It was the will of God. There's one passage that goes, and I wish I wrote it down, but I think it was... Uh, James, the son of Zebedee, was, was, was murdered. And on his way, the history books recall a writer that recorded a Roman soldier that was there. He seen the suffering of James and seen how he wouldn't renounce his Savior. And it caused a Roman soldier to fall to his knees and cry, I believe in Jesus too. Man, that's the will of the Lord. This life is but a vapor, but I have an eternity focus. So we're going to need some endurance and we're going to need some patience to run this race. For yet a little while, and now the, the uh, writer of Hebrews is quoting Habakkuk 2, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And we know that. We believe it. That's the faith that we have. That's the hope that we have. That's the promises we lean on. Psalm 119, 89, 89 through 91. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances. Psalm 119, 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, 
As some men count slackness, but long suffering to us for. Yes. They're right. leaning upon that. He said the writer Habakkuk is saying, he's not going to tarry. I don't know what I know you've been through some things, but just know the Lord is not going to tarry. All right. The writer of Hebrews is pulling from that Old Testament to reach the Jews that he's writing to. Right? Jesus is better, right? Yes. It's pulling from that Old Testament saying, look, right. even the prophets are saying, his word is not void. His word is not slack. It will not return void. And I'm going to come to a close pretty quick, so Sister Leah, if you'd like to help us out on the organ, that would be very helpful. Verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back my soul, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. I'll give you a spoiler alert. Next time, we teach in Hebrews, we'll be on chapter 11, and the writer of Hebrews kind of goes through what, uh, what one, I love what this commentary said. He kind of goes off the honor roll of faith. Chapter 11, he brings up Abel, he brings up Cain, look, I don't know. Let's quote this man. Abel, thank you very much. So he brings up Abel, he brings up Noah, he brings up Moses, he brings up Abraham, he brings up all the all the forefathers before us, the honor roll of faith. And so it's it's now the just shall live by faith. And it, later in chapter 11, he reflects on those that have shown great amounts of faith. So the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And that's just simply saying, the just will live by faith, but if your brother falls, you don't go, oh man, I got one on now. Oh, he, he left the guitar spot over me. Right. Oh man, that's my, this is my opportunity. So and so fell, they left the church. I, I can get on that bass guitar and pastor's finally gonna let me play. No. <coughs> We don't take pleasure in those that have drawn back. We don't take pleasure in those that have fallen away. That's not what this right. is. This is a race, but this is a race that we run and grab as many people as we can with us as we finish, head towards that finish line. This isn't, this isn't the selfish kind of race. And that's what he's saying. We, take, we don't take pleasure in those that have fallen behind, those that have been persecuted and just couldn't take it anymore. We don't take pleasure. We take pain in that. And we take them before prayer. We pray against the devil in their life. We pray that God's will will be done. This isn't a race that's won through selfishness. This is a race that's won with open arms, grabbing as many that we can as we go. That's what he's talking about. It's not right. We don't take pleasure in the drawbacks. Verse 39, this is, this is, it's fun preaching good verses. Amen? Last week I didn't preach very fun verses. It's hard to end on a good note. But 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. We are not of them who draw back unto destruction. Well, that's not us. He's talking to a mature audience. He's not talking to somebody that just now started coming. He's talking to somebody that's been there a while. We're not them. We're strong in the faith, and we're not going to fall to destruction of our souls, to perdition. That's not us. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Let me read that again. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition or destruction, but we are of them that believe yeah. to the saving of the soul. Praise God. That's who we're of. That's who we're of. So call to remembrance some of your afflictions that you might have gone to and gone through, and call to remembrance that the persecution of the Christians has been like, I mean, I, I could pull this book out. Fox's Book of Martyrs does a great job recording many, many, many of the murders and, and, the, and the crucifyings of Christians through just, I mean, I think he covers about 2,000 years in there. I mean, it's just, he, he all the way up to recent events, things in China, things overseas, all the way up. Remember that. Call to remembrance your former days. And don't lose your confidence. Cast not away your confidence that you have in the faith and the hope that we believe that heaven is real, that Jesus is my Savior, that I can put my confidence in Him, I can put my trust in Him, that His Word's not going to return for it, because we are not of them that draw back unto perdition. We are not of them, but we believe to the saving of the soul. Let's all stand and let's pray. I'm going to close and move on to our...
the next part of our service. But Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to be here. I thank you for the promises that you have. I thank you for the redemption that you've given us through Jesus sacrificing on us on the cross, Lord. We thank you for that you paved that way for us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that we, we get every day and we no longer deserve and have never had and deserved. Lord, we thank you for all these opportunities. And we thank you for those that have gone before us, those that have paved the way, those that have fought the wars for freedom so that we can sit in our church and be blessed with no persecution, no affliction, no fight to be had. We just get up and we come to church and we freely worship you, Lord. And I thank you for that opportunity. And I pray that that opportunity would always be here. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Hallelujah. Clap your hands before the Lord. Thank you, Lord.